listen only mode. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our regular monthly Strengthening Families webinar. We're doing something a little bit different with this time and with this technology today. So um, thank you all for tuning in and I hope you'll be active participants in the conversation today. Um, I'm Kaylin O'Connor from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. I will give a little bit of an introduction before we dive in here. Um, <clears throat> these monthly webinars are open to anyone who would like to join who's using the Protective Factors Framework and coordinating Strengthening Families efforts, whether that's at a program or community or state level. Um, we jointly convene the webinars between my organization, CSSP, and our partners at the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds. Um, we, for each month, select a topic, um, usually with guest speakers, and uh, that might be coordinated by CSSP, by the Alliance, or by a volunteer from the National Network. All of these webinars are recorded, including today's, and we always have the materials posted. The Alliance posts them on a Google site that actually is a very rich archive of all the webinars we've done for the past several years, um, so you can scroll there and see through there and see what topics have been covered and um, if you miss a call you can always go back and check on it there. Now we do this the second Thursday of each month. I wanted to be sure that you know next month on October 13th we will hear about transforming child and family services in Arlington County. Um, this is one of the jurisdictions that has really embraced the protective factors, protective and promotive factors framework in their uh, child welfare services and now expanding into their behavioral health services. Um, and so we'll hear from Tabitha Kelly there about the work that they've been doing and um, hopefully a lot of you who are interested in getting this into child welfare systems will tune in and hear about some of the strategies they've been using there. Our subsequent dates will be November 10th and December 8th. Those topics are yet to be announced. And as always, if you have content you'd like to share or a topic you think we should cover in a future webinar, feel free to contact me um, or type it in the chat box during today's webinar. So for today, we're trying something new, a technical assistance clinic. Um, trying to think of this as an opportunity to learn from each other, to share our experiences, and perhaps even identify some opportunities to collaborate. Um, I will say that I got the idea for this from two thoughts, basically. One was um, a recent opportunity to be in Alabama at their Children's Trust Fund grantee conference um, and having some time, uh, we did a breakout session where we just had sort of questions and answers about strengthening families implementation and it was really rich to hear people share their own experiences and um, answer each other's questions as well as for me to be there and be able to answer some uh, in terms of what resources are available from CSSP and I thought that's the kind of opportunity that we don't get enough of because we're not all together very often. Um, and since it's been a while since we had a Strengthening Families Summit, I thought um, let's try to sort of recreate some of that magic um, <laughs> through a webinar technology and see if we can get some uh, cross-state national input on people's questions and share experiences and learn from each other. So I'm very glad that we had two states volunteer to sort of workshop their Strengthening Families implementation. First we'll hear from Georgia, Pat Minish is with us, um, who's been the chair of Strengthening Families Georgia for a long time and has been doing great work there. Um, then we'll hear from Tish McInnes in uh, Alabama, who's coordinating Strengthening Families work there um, for the Alabama Partnership for Children in partnership with their Children's Trust Fund. So they will each have some time to share what they're doing and some of the questions they're facing and then um, hear from all of us with responses. Then we'll go through some of the questions that were submitted in advance. Um, I've put them onto slides so that we can sort of all know where we are and in some cases there are resources to be shared um, to go with those. Um, but hoping that some of you will jump in when a question comes up that you've got a perspective on or even if it triggers an additional question for you. Um, and then Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to get to questions that were submitted as we go. If not, um, if we don't get through all the questions submitted in advance or questions that are typed in as we're going, uh, we will try to get back to you with answers um, to those questions you had. I will also say if this is a successful format, we can do this again. <laughs> and so if there are questions we haven't answered and people want to continue the conversation, we can schedule that in for later in the year. So a few go-to webinar tips. Um, I always share this one about um, how you're connecting 
um, and whether uh, if you're having trouble with your audio connection, I always encourage you to switch between your telephone and the mic and speakers in your computer. But it's important to make sure that GoToWebinar knows which way you're doing it. So you'll see a little image there of the control panel um, and how you know whether you're on phone or mic and speakers. And I encourage you to switch that if you need it. If you're having trouble with the technology, type in a question and we will try to help you. Um, and then special for today, I wanted to make sure that you're aware of the questions feature. Um, I put screenshots here. One of the uh, desktop-based go-to webinar version, which is down the right side of your screen. Um, the other is the newer, if you're just connecting on the web, um, you, your interface might look more like this one in the middle here. Um, but either way, there's a questions option. <laughs> and if you type there, um, we on the organizer end of this will be able to see your question. We'll type in a response and share it with everyone. So people should be able to see those exchanges. Um, we'll try to respond quickly and um, make sure that everyone <clears throat> can see it. So even if you just have a comment on something someone else has said, type it in as a comment. We'll just type thank you and make sure it's visible to everyone. Um, you can also raise your hand if you would like to speak. We can unmute you and are happy to do that, especially if you're in a place without a lot of background noise. <laughs> um, if you do have a lot of background noise, you may prefer to stick with typing. So I think that's all the technical details I needed to cover. Does anyone have um, questions or comments before I jump in? Okay, so here's um, some of the sort of our panel of who's here to respond today. Um, I'm joined by some of my colleagues from CSSP, Judy Langford, who's a senior fellow and longtime director of the Strengthening Families Initiative, and Charlene Harper-Brown, who's a senior associate and also a longtime member of the Strengthening Families team. Um, and there I am, <laughs> Kaylin O'Connor. I'm a senior policy analyst at CSSP. We're also joined by Teresa Raffel and Martha Reeder from the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds and by all of you. So I included some pictures, one from our most recent Strengthening Families Summit and one from a, a National Alliance meeting from last year, just to show some of the faces that are <laughs> hopefully going to be chiming in today. Hope you can spot yourself in, uh, in one of these photos. All right, so let's jump in to the state implementation part of our webinar. Um, we're gonna start with Georgia. Uh, Pat Minish is here with us. I'm not sure if Jeanette has jumped on yet. She had another meeting ending around this time. <laughs> but um, Pat's going to talk about uh, what they've been doing in Strengthening Families Georgia, what some of their key questions have been at different turning points in the initiative, and then open it up to um, some of what they're facing now. And I will just point out that in your handout section of the webinar, um, you can see the Georgia state profile. Um, Georgia underscore 2016 is the one that's relevant for this if you're interested in learning more about what they're doing. So with that, I'll hand it over to Pat. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with everyone today. And I'm really interested to learn from each state as well. Um, I thought what I'd start with was talking about some of the initial challenges. I realize that all states are at different stages of implementation. So I want to talk briefly about the initial challenges that we faced in Georgia and, and some of the strengths with each of the, the turning points. So we've been um, using Strengthening Families in Georgia formally since 2006, but it really was introduced in 2001 um, with some model programs that were funded by NACI. But in 2006, the things that helped us the most was that Judy Langford came down and did a strategic planning session with, with Georgia. And then that year we had our first funding from the CBCAP funds. Additionally, I think it's critically important, I think all of you already know this, that you have to have a champion in your states. And for us, Carol Steele, who is now with DFEX, has been our champion since the beginning. And strong coordinators. Um, Jeanette Meyer is our state coordinator, and I now have a um, part-time training coordinator as well. I, I want folks to realize that Georgia does not have much money to um, administer strengthening families. We have some funding and it totals up to probably less than $100,000. But our staff really are con all consultants and it's less than a half-time person. So we get a lot of mileage out of all 
all our collaborative leaders. And so that was one of the big problems that we faced and think all states faced earlier is how do we not only maintain consistent leadership within strengthening families, but how do we collaborate to develop our activities and strategic plan? So that those I think were our two big initial questions. And one of in Georgia, strengthening families is administered by the Georgia Association of Young Children, the state affiliate of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. So we're not in a large um, state agency, and there are pros and cons um, to that. So the advantage is that we've been able, we have a lot of collaborative partners, because GOSC has always worked with all collaborative partners. So we have a lot of collaborative partners who have embedded um, strengthening families into their organizations. The con of that is that we don't have a major agency that has embedded it, although we do have um, our partner as the Department of Early Care and Learning has embedded it thoroughly within their quality rated programs, but we don't have that funding from a major agency um, sitting in, the, in, in uh, strengthening families. So there are pros and cons, but we've managed um, through that collaboration um, to, we're actually going to start this next year on our second strategic plan, five-year strategic plans. So it took a lot of time for us to figure out how, how do we work together to not only develop the strategic plan, but then how to implement it. And the only way that we were able to do that is we developed, not in addition to the leadership team, we developed a partnership. And the partnership team off the beginning were different parts of our strategic plan that we wanted to write. So that was the partnership initially. Um, five years later, the partnership turned into our implementation teams. So it's really the grassroots um, organizations are our partnership team this, uh, at this point in time, whereas earlier in time, they were really the ones who helped us put together the first strategic plan. This next year, I actually have a little bit of funding to help us, uh, guide us in our strategic planning. So always that little bit of funding helps. The other big question when we first started that kept coming up and coming up and coming up is what is our evaluation plan? And I know all states probably have struggled with this at some point in their development. We finally hired in 2011 an evaluation consultant. And that has really helped us move forward. It was a huge turning point for us. And because we not only developed a, a state logic model, and all of this is available on our website, which is strengthening families GA for Georgia um, dot net. And in terms of um, developing that evaluation plan. It helped us not only with the logic model, but also a visual model of how we want to move forward and three main strategies that we wanted to focus on. And in terms of those strategies for us, that helped us kind of guide our work is what I want to say. So training in TEA is one of our big strategies. Another one is engagement. And the third big strategy is educational awareness. So those are the the three thrusts, I should say, of, of how we move strengthening families forward in Georgia. Um, later, let's say maybe around oh, in the five-year to seven-year point um, where strengthening families was, was in Georgia, our, our questions um, became, well, how do we actually operationalize embedding strengthening families into different organizations? How, how do they... How do we illuminate that path for them to move forward and embed strengthening families? And so what we've done is we have, well, there are several different strategies that we're trying. One of them is a tip sheet that we've developed on how to embed strengthening your organization, which has some very simple kinds of um, techniques or activities like, you know, link to our SFG website or on your email signature, mention that you're an SFG trainer or a or a uh, SFG supporter. But some very simple things to very complicated things, which are like, are you providing strengthening families training? Um, is strengthening families embedded in your grants? Is strengthening families embedded in, in your contracts, in your professional development, um, in your um, PR that you put out into the field? So there are, there are different like levels, basically, of, of, of how we're 
giving advice on how to embed strengthening families through that tip sheet. Um, even though we have several major agencies, so in Georgia, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier that Quality Rated has adopted, basically in 2012, um, they adopted Strengthening Families as their family partnership standard under the QRIS. And so uh, individuals participating, programs participating in the QRS in Georgia then not only view an online overview of Strengthening Families, um, which we developed, and that has been viewed and completed. It's a two-hour course. It's been completed by 20,000 individuals in the state of Georgia. So training in TA is a, is a big piece of our um, approach, and that has been another major turning point for us that was happened around 2011, 2012. So in addition to it being embedded strongly into our Department of Early Care and Learning, we also developed a six module trainings, one on each of the protective factors and an overview that is delivered face to face. Along with that, we developed a Strengthening Families Georgia training of trainers. So at this point now, about five years later, we now have 234 trainers who deliver face to face Strengthening Families Georgia information in our state. And we've delivered face to face about 6,000 to 6,000 participants. So overall, we've got about 26,000 individuals we've reached through training. So that has been huge in terms of awareness, in terms of, of helping others understand what Strengthening Families is and begin to embed it within their everyday work. So those were major um, turning points for us. In terms of challenges that we're facing now, um, I think the, probably the biggest um, challenge that we're facing is, is buy-in from child welfare. So we have absolute buy-in from DOE in terms of they've embedded in their 360-degree standards. We have buy-in from the Department of Early Care and Learning. They've embedded in QRS. We, in, it, we have engagement and embeddedness from United Way from all kinds of organizations, from the home visiting programs to the Georgia Department of Public Health through Project Launch, through the University of Georgia, through Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, many, many others. I can't name them all, obviously, but many others have embedded it within their programs. Um, but child welfare has had a lot of transition in Georgia, so a lot of transition in the leadership, which we meet with every single time. So our biggest challenge over this next strategic plan, um, and I'm really hopeful with all the great modules that have been developed um, by CSSD, the eight scripted modules that have been developed for child welfare, I'm hoping that that will be one of our ways into child welfare um, in Georgia. So I, I should say that one of the things that has helped us over many years is all the information that's been put out by CSSP. That has really, really helped us. All the documents and everything. We use a lot of them and, and, and use them. Jeanette, I, I need to praise Jeanette Meyer, too, who is our state coordinator for Strengthening Families. Um, she is the glue that holds Strengthening Families together. So if you don't have a good coordinator, even, she's just part time, keep in mind. Um, but if you don't have a good coordinator who, when someone emails about what's happening, um, you know, they want an update or whatever, or they want to know how can we use this in our program, she's on it. And she connects the dots. She connects all the partners. If she sees something come from CSSP, for example, about oh, toxic stress, immediately she sent all that stuff out to people who are really focused on toxic stress in our partnership. So she is the, the glue, I think, that holds um, Strengthening Families. And one of the the key pieces of any strong um, strengthening families group. So our biggest challenge, as I mentioned, was was working through with, with child welfare. So I'm really excited and interested to hear more uh, on the next uh, call that we have. Um, in terms of other efforts, we did in, in 2015 put up a website for Strengthening Families Georgia. So that has also helped us a lot in terms of awareness and being able to send people places where they can download documents. So we have been doing since 2011 newsletters and parent newsletters and professional newsletters. And so they're all archived there on the website. 
In addition, this year we developed posters and postcards, thanks to Alaska's um, great model. And and we have put those the link to those also up on, on, on the website. So all of those things have helped with, with the awareness kinds of things. Um, this next year, what we're focusing on, and I'll wrap up and be glad to answer any questions, but this next year what we're focusing on is we're going to have um, the evaluation committee, and we do have, I should say that too, we have four committees, governance, evaluation, strategic planning, and resource development. We created four committees because we, we realized there was with just a very, very part-time staff, we realized we needed more support in those areas and more stability in those areas. And it was also a way to keep the transparency and the engagement of our leadership team. Um, so this next year, though, what we're also doing to help drive the next strategic plans, we're going to have focus groups on strengthening families from our partners to see you know, what, what are their needs. How can how can we help them? How can they help us? And and how to get more depth and more in rich uh, information on how they're embedding strengthening families in their programs. Um, we're also going to do an evaluation of the leadership team, which we really have not done before. I don't know why we haven't done it before. And we're going to use um, the CSSP document as as an idea for framing our evaluation, the one that's the leadership team roles and functions, I believe it's called. So that's a little bit about what Georgia is doing. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try and help answer them. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, we had one question typed in already, um, and I will encourage anyone else who had either a question about Georgia's implementation or some thoughts about the challenges she mentioned. Um, for example, if anybody has done an evaluation of your leadership team, I'm sure we'd love to hear about that. Um, so if you have information like that, feel free to type it in or raise your hand and we'll unmute you. But in the meantime, um, I will read the first question that came in. This is from Riel Kraft in Pennsylvania, who asks, um, what kind of information do you collect from trainers about who they are training? Just numbers or demographics, evaluation information regarding change in knowledge, skills, and attitudes? That's a really good question. And so we collect not only the demographics, like the county that they're from, but we also have a code for what discipline they're in. So our modules are across, they're geared to be across disciplines. So it might be someone from social work, from child welfare, it might be someone from um, the public school system, it might be someone from child care. So there's a code. So we collect by discipline. And then on the evaluation, we do have a standardized evaluation form that we use. So all trainers have to use and submit their sign-in sheets and their evaluations. From the sign-in sheets, um, what they have to add is if they want to receive the, the newsletters, the professional newsletters, they add their email address. But back to the question about, you know, how do you know they change? There are four questions we have at the end of the evaluation, um, which are fill in the blank kinds of questions in terms of, and they, they try to get at how will you use this in your work and how will you embed strengthening families in your work. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in yet or hands raised. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move to Tish's um, sharing about Alabama, and uh, we may cycle back to you, Pat. And um, also as other questions come up, um, I'm sure uh, you may have something to uh, <laughs> to add. Sorry, I got distracted because two more questions just popped up. Um, uh, one is directly related to what you just said, so let's get to that. It's what data system do you utilize for evaluation? And that's a question from Maria Hernandez. And so we don't have a remote system. They actually, for well, for the online system, we actually do have. But we use an outside vendor um, for um, the online system. And that is funded by the Department of Early Care and Learning. And so they do collect evaluations um, via that. And then in terms of our others are face-to-face, -face, and they are literally are just uploaded to Dropbox. So all trainers upload their, their science sheets and their evaluations to Dropbox and then those are coded. Um, so there's not a, a electronic way that we have used yet. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and the other question that came in, which we'll get to later, is are strengthening families usually initiated by local jurisdictions or government agencies, and what role are nonprofits playing? So we will definitely address that. I think you'll actually hear some of the answer to that as we go through another state story, um, and then <clears throat> we can address it more directly. So let's um, go in to Tish now from Alabama. Many thanks, Pat, for sharing um, your information. And um, I'm sure we will we'll keep you on the line here so you <laughs> can keep answering other questions as they come up. Thank you. Okay, our next uh, state workshop is um, from Strengthening Families Alabama. Tish McInnes is the coordinator for Strengthening Families there through the Alabama Partnership for Children in partnership with the Children's Trust Fund. And um, you will see, again, in the handout section, Alabama's state profile is there. And um, Tish also sent in some slides. So Tish, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, and you can just let me know as you'd like <laughs> me to advance through your slides. Okay. Um, I'm just going to start off. I, every time I uh, hear another state talk about what they're doing, I, I jot down everything else that I need to be doing. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give, uh, if we're doing an overview of what's going on in our states to let you know what is happening in Alabama, um, and we're busy. All of the, the things that you see on this slide are the ways in which I am out and we are spreading strengthening families across the state. Um, I took a lot of this from a, a presentation that I've done. I was real tickled to hear um, Rogel ask a question because she and I actually did a co-presentation on strengthening families um, in Philadelphia this summer, talking about strengthening families and, and what both of those states are doing. And I just kind of want to go through these so that you'll know what they are. Um, we do, we, we bring in the community cafe, and I put conversation in community cafe up there because um, the state, there's a lot of partners with us that have really taken to the community cafe mode, and so we're now beginning to also uh, spread that community cafe out and do some other things with some different agencies. But the next one is the most important because we were so fortunate um, here in the state where we were just doing strengthening families in connection with family resource centers and then all of a sudden uh, we were so fortunate. Our state received, we were one of the ones that got the first class pre-K grant and with that written inside that grant through our Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education they said that all of those pre-K classrooms would adapt the Strengthening Family Protective Factors model. And in order to give that to them, uh, training had to be had. So we were busy in that every single monitor, every teacher, and every lead staff in a first class pre-K classroom completely over the state of Alabama has uh, undergone um, training on strengthening families. They are required to do the online training module. And um, we picked that up and also put that into home visitation. We've had some Head Start programs that are funded by CTF and um, by our uh, early childhood education which has resulted in, again, having strengthening family, the protective factors put into those programs. We do it with HIPPY. We have done it with our foster care program, which we call Kids and Kin. Uh, and, and so it's just blossoming. And so it's, um, it really is becoming embedded in a lot of places that have anything, family and children. Our Books, Files and Blocks coincides with our Help Me Grow Alabama program. Um, it is an activity where children can come for screening, uh, for developmental screening and monitoring, uh, and then go into the Help Me Grow program. But there's not a time that I'm not at one of those events because I talk about in the child development part of the protective factors 
the importance of the developmental screening. And so those books, files, and blocks are very important, and the materials for strengthening family protective factors are always a part of that. Um, also, uh, I have connected this work with the Learn the Signs Act Early through the Center for Disease Control um, with their program. And so again, it falls under that protective factor of knowledge of parenting and child development. So those, those wonderful collaborations are there. And because of the strengthening family work that has been done, um, we are, are getting some invitations to do a lot of presentations locally and nationally. Um, such as being able to do the one up in Philadelphia. So um, I just really wanted to go. That's, that's the way that we're embedding strengthening families across this state. You know, I want to also say before I flip to the next slide, you know, when, when you talk about who your champions are, Sally Longshore is definitely it. Sally requires of every single CTF grantee that they undergo the online training. And, um, you know, that's significant for every single grantee that she has across the state. To have to have that embedded just takes it and it goes even farther. So if you'll flip to the next slide. All right. I, what I wanted to do was just give you an example of all of these different uh, groups. And I, I thought there's no other better way to give you a snippet of, of what this looks like across the state for who it is that our, par our key partners um, that are there. And you will see we've got um, early childhood education is through the Alabama Great Seal. But we've got our Help Me Grow, our Department of Rehab Services, United Way, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, Department of Mental Health, that's Project Launch. Um, and you see we're just it's everywhere. And I think that's one of the proudest things that we can say is that it's just we are trying to embed strengthening families so that there's not a single agency around that has anything to do with children and parents that they are not hearing strengthening families protective factors. And uh, it's, it's a great success um, when we can talk about that in a group and everybody knows that we're talking about instead of going, huh, what is this? But I, I thought it was a, a great way to show you some of the things that we've, that we've got going. And then my, my last slide that I have here, um, if you'll flip to it, Kaylin. Um, I'm real sorry, Kaylin. I, I thought, well, I thought I had a better picture of you instead of one being blurred. <laughs> but I was so excited at our grantee training this year that we have everybody that has received a CTF grant comes together one time a year and we just, you know, everybody has an opportunity really to network. And um, when Sally had shared with me that you were coming to present that, um, you know, it's it, that was tremendous. People know your name and of course I, I love Jim McKay. I think he's great at everything that he does. Um, but I'm sorry I didn't get a picture of you and Sally, but I wanted to be able to share um, that little bit and that it just goes to show if all of the agencies that we've got across the state that are CTF funded um, are out doing this work and they're sharing this work, um, you know, it's, it continues to grow. Now some of the challenges that I've had is because we've had quick growth in some things, um, quick growth in some areas that um, for a while it was just me, but we are starting now. We've, we've got two other individuals that are trained trainers through the Alliance, which has tr been tremendous and is helping. And, you know, as I hear people talk about their, their training teams, I'm thinking, yeah, we're going to have one of those one of these days. But the greatest thing that we've got going is our parent leadership yeah. network. And it was one of the things that over the past couple of years as we have gone around and have worked to embed strengthening families really have been working one-on-one -on -one with several different groups across the state who have provided us some really strong parent leaders. And uh, our plan right now is that 
during 2016, the rest of this year and next year, is that we are going to grow that leadership team, which we have not had that's consisted of parents helping us to drive what we've been doing. And so, um, you know, my, my greatest challenge is going to be pulling that one together. And, and I will openly say to anybody who's got a strong um, parent leadership program that we would love to hear from them and what they're doing and how they're, they're making that grow. Um, we do not have a website yet. We have some social media, but it is really by what we call our cohorts. It's our parent leadership network uh, cohorts. They have their own individual social media sites where they are getting together, and a part of this team is going to be to connect all of them together across the state. Um, and really, that's that's what we've been doing here in Alabama. So Great. I will welcome any questions, do my best to answer, and I will be bold enough to say that if somebody asks me a question I can't answer, that hopefully Sally is listening and she'll be able to mute, unmute herself and answer those questions as well if we can. Thank you so much, Tish. Um, I don't see any questions coming in yet. Please un, uh, raise your hand if you'd like to say something or uh, type in a question if you've got one. Um, I think actually this would be a good time to just quickly answer the question um, that came in earlier. Um, I'm trying to pull it out where I can actually see it. There we go. Um, about um, who generally leading strengthening families work, um, whether it's initiated by local jurisdiction or by government agencies, and what role nonprofits are playing. And the short answer to that question submitted by Ramona Taylor Williams would be. Yes, um, it's implemented by all of those. Um, we have uh, strong state leadership teams in, in uh, 35 states that are part of this national network. Um, and so in those cases, um, that's where we're connecting with the people who are driving this work that's primarily happening through state agencies, but also through nonprofits, whether that's um, in many states, the Children's Trust Fund is a nonprofit. Um, in some cases, it's a state agency or a public-private partnership. Um, but oftentimes they're in a leadership role or one of the leads at the state level for this work. Uh, but we also know of many places where county agencies or local community entities are leading work to do strengthening families at the local or county level. Um, we also know of places where there's just individual programs that have found this information online, gotten themselves some training, whether online or offered by the state, and are implementing it not very much connected to um, the efforts that are going on at the state level or at the county level. So it's happening at all levels. Um, the role of nonprofits varies a lot, but if anyone else wants to jump in on that, please do. <laughs> okay, maybe I answered it. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a question about, Ramona had a follow-up question about whether Mississippi is one of the states. We do not have a leadership team in Mississippi. We would love to add Mississippi to the network, so let me know if you would uh, like to connect about what that might look like. Um, we do have a note from Sally saying, um, I'm on the call by telephone but wasn't able to unmute. Thanks to Tish, and we are very proud of our Strengthening Families work in Alabama. Thank you, Sally. Um, and I can unmute you if you have more you'd like to say. <laughs> but right now it looks like um, your phone connection may have gone. So um, I can unmute you. Uh, let's try that. Okay, so uh, you need to enter your audio pin, and then we'd be able to unmute you. Um, and I think um, if we don't have other questions coming in for Alabama, let's get into the specific questions that um, some of you submitted when you registered for the webinar or that uh, you sent to me by email separately. So let's get into those. The first question is from Julie Day at the New Hampshire Children's Trust. We are looking for some language around resilient communities. What does it look like and how do we get there? And uh, I know Judy Langford is um, eager to have this conversation um, and is having this conversation <laughs> in other settings as well. So Judy's going to share her thoughts on that. And if others of you want to type in or raise your hand if you'd like to weigh in, please do. Hi Julie, this is Judy Langford, and as Kaylin said, I'm I'm eager, because not 
because I have the answer to your question, but because so many people are talking about this, and we certainly hope that we'll have some more information about it pretty soon. I did want to mention that one of the things that CSSP is doing right now is working in conjunction with the Prevention Institute in California with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look more deeply into this whole issue about resilient communities. And we, we hesitate to talk about it in terms of protect community protective factors, but that's that's the lingo we use in strengthening families, and that's exactly what we hope we'll be able to produce over the next year are those a, a, a simple way of combining what the evidence tells us about what are those specific elements in a community that need to be in place to promote healthy development for young children as well as the kind of social networks and community efficacy that make it possible for communities to do what it is that they need to do. There's um, some emerging information about uh, what people are calling resilient communities through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and um, there's a little network that's beginning um, about resilient communities around the country. We don't have a complete framework together yet, but um, I think that the way we are talking about it is that a resilient community has many outcomes that we want to foster. Healthy development of young children, strong families, a community that is uh, that has the kind of efficacy that's important to sustain the positive development of young children and the strength of families. So that's that's what we know today and uh, keep asking because we'll start to come up with some of the part, part of the problem as you know is pulling the evidence together about what goes underneath a framework like that so we can be really sure that we know what we're talking about when we go out there. Thank you, Judy. Did anyone else want to share thoughts on that? We did have a uh, link posted, um, which I think you should be able to see in your uh, question boxes, which is uh, an interesting resource, the communityresiliencecookbook.org. Definitely one to check out. And I see that Maureen Durning has a thought to share. So Maureen, I'm going to unmute you. Are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Beautiful, yes. Oh, good. Um, well, when I saw the, the phrase looking for some language around resilient communities, here in Idaho, a lot of the work we're doing, we're trying to use the language of the protective factor. So it seems to me the language you're looking for is what we've already got. You know, So a resilient community would be one that fosters healthy social connections and has many opportunities for knowledge of um, parenting and child development, et cetera. Um, so I guess my answer is the language is what we've already got. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. I think that's a good point. I think there is, um, it's possible to apply the language we already have around protective factors to some of it to saying, well, a, a resilient community would be one that makes all these protective factors abundant for families and make sure that families have supports they need to get these protective factors. But I think we also want to take a step back and say, what else is going on in communities um, that makes them resilient as communities and that makes the people in them more likely to be resilient? And so it's a little bit of stepping back from the focus on young children and their families and looking more at community characteristics. Um, one piece that we recently put out that you might find interesting too, Julie, is um, called Building Blocks for Early Learning Communities. I actually think it's called Early Learning Communities, Building Blocks for Success, um, where we t are starting to look at what, what needs to be in place in a community for it to be what we would call an early learning community, where all children and families have the supports they need for their children to thrive. Um, closely related, <laughs> of course. Um, and I think you might find that interesting where we started to uh, separate out what are some of the policies, what are some of the community and neighborhood characteristics 
um, and what are the programs and services, and what's the sort of community culture that's supportive of children and families. So um, I will try to put in a link to that, although that <laughs> perhaps someone else can put in a link to that because I can't jump onto the website to grab the link while I have the webinar running on my computer. Um, anyone else want to share thoughts about resilient communities? Um, um, Kaylin, this is Sharlyn. Um, in keeping with the language of the Strengthening Families um, Protective Factors Framework and, and talking about resilience, one of the things that we have been emphasizing most recently is that the end result of resilience should be growth and you know positive growth and um, in individuals and families and certainly in communities and so it's more than um, just the you know the typical uh, bouncing back construct of what resiliency is or recovering from trauma it has to be not only just that but there also should be growth and so as we talk about resilient communities or a, a resilience in communities we really have to focus on what are those things that will help it also to um, you know those structures those those opportunities those um, um, resources in the community that helps the community to grow in a positive way so I just want you know to keep keep that in mind as well that's a really good point thank you Charlene um, one other thing I was going to mention, oh, was someone about to speak? Well, this is Martha Reeder. I just wanted to share some of the things that we're hearing in the trainings that we're conducting across the country um, about resilient communities because a lot of the cohorts of trainers that we are training represent a community as they discuss um, the, the different activities in the training and they have table discussions, it, it, it seems to be a consensus among everyone that those resilient communities have a, a, a tapestry of all those protective factors, which would be positive social connections, um, access to basic needs and, and concrete support, and um, many of the other uh, that it really is that all of those things woven together and that uh, in, in some of the exercises we have where there's a lot of discussion about this, um, that is always the conclusion that, that we're hearing. Very helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the one other point I was going to make is, uh, this is Kaylin, that uh, if you Google resilient communities or resilient cities, uh, there's some, it's interesting to me that um, there's a lot of work going on with that label, of resilient cities in particular, about cities being resilient to climate change and to natural disasters um, and to terrorism. And so when we think about a city or a community being resilient, there's a broader frame of the type of adversity <laughs> that you can experience at a city or community level. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if they are at the point that Charlene made about getting to growth from those experiences or if it's just about bouncing back and staying functioning. But just an interesting thing um, to, to put in the hopper there as you continue thinking about resilient communities. Okay, I think we're going to move to our next question. Um, and uh, we did have someone else chime in saying, yes, I'm more familiar with resilient cities from a climate perspective. So that is a, a language that's being used in that realm, which we might need to figure out um, how we both differentiate what we're talking about, but also how we connect with that work, because maybe, maybe there are similar uh, concerns and characteristics. This is Judy Kalen. Let me just point out the uh, resource that Maureen uh, pointed out about the cookbook for resilient communities was written by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program officer for the work that we're doing now. And that piece of resilience is very related to the work that we do around children and families. So uh, we'll keep you posted on the next steps on that. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question is one that comes up a lot, and um, pretty much any time we mention cafes on one of these webinars, there are questions about it, and so I know it's a 
something that a lot of people are really interested in. So I was glad that um, we had this question submitted from Jessica Wilder and uh, Santa Maria Community Services in Cincinnati about, do you have advice on helping communities develop parent cafes? And I know there are a lot of people on the line who know a lot about cafes. I'm going to point out a couple things before we hear from um, some of those other people. Um, in your handouts, I put our cafe overview and fidelity checklist. This is um, <clears throat> a short document that we developed at CSSP with a working group of people with experience in these different cafe models that are listed here um, and trying to really boil down the common ground um, across all these models when we are doing cafes with an aim towards building parent leadership and protective factors, what needs to be in place um, and what can we uh, see as the core fidelity elements that make us think it will be effective in reaching those outcomes. So I encourage you to check out that handout if you haven't seen it before or if you just want to refresh your memory. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of the three models um, that, of CAFE that have all grown out of the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework. The first was Parent CAFE, um, which was developed by Strengthening Families Illinois um, and now uh, housed at Be Strong Families, which grew out of Strengthening Families Illinois. Um, the Community CAFE was developed by Community CAFE Collaborative in Washington State. Um, and you can find materials about it on the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Fund's website. Um, and then Caring Conversations was developed by Zero to Three in partnership with the Minnesota um, Children's Trust, or sorry, Minnesota Communities Caring for Children, and um, I believe also North Carolina. I may have said that wrong. Uh, but that's another model that's actually designed for parents and providers together. So having said that, I wanted to invite um, I'm not sure if anyone from Be Strong Families is on the line. If you are, please raise your hand and I will um, unmute you so that you have a chance to speak. But I do know that Teresa was going to talk a bit about Community Cafe. So Teresa, why don't you go ahead um, and talk about Community Cafe and then we'll see if someone wants to refer to talk about Parent Cafe as well. Great, Kaylin. Thanks. And hi, everyone. And I have just added another link in the chat box. Um, thank you, Kaylin, for putting the one you put on the uh, slide. And we have in another location on our website um, a printed guidebook for Community Cafe Host. Um, and it, it seems to be a really valuable tool for folks. So I wanted to make sure you had easy access to it as well. So the, the community cafes, uh, like the parent cafes, um, are an adaptation of the World Cafe approach. And what we have found is that a number of trust funds and others are finding them very helpful for planning purposes. The, the protective factors are embedded um, and, and they are best and most often led by parents or, or by a parent and staff combination. And uh, it's, there is a community cafe leadership team that's based in Olympia. The Alliance serves as kind of a national umbrella for that work. And um, through us, uh, a lot of folks contract with the leadership team. Robin Higa, who was one of the founding parents, is still part of that work and travels to help folks um, orient host and do trainings and think about how to evaluate the results. But um, I encourage you to look at both approaches. I think it's probably ideal to have parent cafes and community cafes to um, achieve different purposes. And both have tremendous value. So um, if you're at all interested, I hope you'll look online in both places and also at the zero to three work and consider sequencing or what might work best for your immediate needs. And just to know that any of the folks listed on this slide, including the Alliance, but I know I speak for the others, um, would be really happy to have a conversation or do whatever is uh, needed to help you in implementation. It's probably not the time to go into detail about implementation, but just to say it's very powerful, seemingly simple, but with great results, opportunity to engage with the community to help promote protective factors and to help promote partnerships with parents in the community. 
thank you for raising the question, and thank you, Caitlin. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I'm actually going to go now to Connie Dunlap at uh, Supporting Families Together Association in Wisconsin, who's going to talk about how uh, Wisconsin has been rolling out parent cafes um, through uh, through this throughout the state. So, Connie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I'm the project manager for our Parent Cafe statewide project here in Wisconsin, um, and one of and we are implementing the Be Strong Families Parent Cafes. Um, and I guess one of the um, suggestions or advice for helping for developing parent cafes and communities when we we brought Be Strong Families here and had all of our um, staff trained at all of our various. Um, we're doing them now in 17 communities um, through our project and hoping to be expanding more shortly here with bringing Be Strong Families back. Um, but we um, we had our teams, when we had Be Strong Families come, we had communities um, come in teams. So it wasn't just one agency that was taking the burden on of doing, planning, facilitating, the budget or finding the funds to um, facilitate and host all of the cafe sessions. We had them come in teams of um, at least two, ideally three um, agents. So then that can spread the spread the burden of the finding the funds, finding um, the staff time and all of that across the multiple agencies. So that would be one thing that I would encourage if you're thinking about implementing cafes, um, collaborating with other um, local agencies and being strategic about who you collaborate with. We really encouraged our teams to find like, Head Starts or other agencies that we know that they have family engagement funding federally to help um, sustain their projects. Because we did have funding for them to implement, but now we're in the sustainability planning, so a lot of our sites are um, trying to find local organizations to sponsor meals or sponsor sessions. Um, they're partnering with local churches who are providing um, free space um, or for doing potlucks. So being very creative with um, how they're um, figuring out how to sustain these, as well as apply, applying for local um, grants to keep them going. But that we've been very successful with the Be Strong Families model, um, and we've recruited a lot of parents as part of our sustainability plan. Um, all of the sites have been required to recruit parents to train, and then to train to become table hosts, as well as a facilitator if they felt confident enough in that role. And all of our sites have exceeded beyond our expectations of getting parents recruited. So the goal is for our agencies to be the backbone of these projects in the future, and the parents are truly leading and doing that peer-to-peer -peer conversation with all parents. So any questions, you can feel free to um, let Kayla know, and she can connect you with me. Um, we do have a Pinterest page that we put all of our sites, or all of our communities, um, they send pictures of their cafes with different themes and centerpiece ideas. So, so that's a really cool resource that's open to anybody. So our website is supportingfamiliestogether.org. Um, and we have, um, like I said, a Pinterest page. Um, we've got some videos up there of some parents who have attended our cafes um, and some other resources as well. So just wanted to let everybody know about that. Wow, great. That's cool. I never heard about that Pinterest page before. I might actually have to join Pinterest. Thanks, Connie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, we. this is, um, I think we're having a great conversation. Unfortunately, the time is ticking away faster than I anticipated. Um, and so I think what I want to do for these last couple minutes that we have together um, is jump to one other question that um, where we had some concrete examples to give and some materials in the handouts. So the question was about examples of public messaging around the protective factors framework and um, that was submitted by Rebecca and Becky at the Wisconsin Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. Um, so I wanted to share uh, these images of posters from uh, the Great Start Coalition um, from Charlevoix, Emmett, and Northern Antrim counties in northern Michigan. Um, these posters are available to order off their website, whatmakesyourfamilystrong.org, and they're fantastic, developed um, in a collaborative process with parents in the community and posted all over those communities um, in any places where families spend their time. <clears throat> I also wanted to um, share a couple other examples. Um, Jim McKay is on the line and was going to talk briefly about um, some videos they've done in West Virginia uh, to get the word out about strengthening families. So, Jim, are you... Let's see, I didn't unmute you yet. Uh, sorry about that. Finding you on the list. Oh, uh, okay, Jim, you need to enter an audio pin before we can unmute you. 
Um, so if you do that, <laughs> it should have uh, shown up for you. In the meantime, um, there's also a flyer in your handout section from Colorado that's a parent flyer they developed that describes the protective factors. Um, that was part of their Child Abuse Prevention Month activities. Um, I, I believe that was this year. Um, and uh, let's see, I think I can unmute Jim now. Are you there? Hi, Kaylin. Uh, hi, everybody. I, I know we're uh, right up on our time, but just to, just to let you know, um, so the, the links you have here, uh, and if you go to preventchildabusewv.org or strengthingfamilieswv, you can see our video. It's about a 10-minute video that walks you through the protective factors and includes the updated everyday actions and so forth from the summit a couple of years ago and all the updated language. Also wanted to um, apologize for the background noise that just got turned up in my background. Uh, but um, also our we worked in partnership with West Virginia Public Broadcasting on a really nice documentary that they published called or produced called The First Thousand Days, uh, Investing When It Counts for West Virginia Children. And they really embrace the protective factors. And so you can view that full documentary online. Uh, there's a lot of additional content, including a little segment uh, that that features me going through in about three, four minutes talking about the protective factors. Um, lastly, uh, just if you're interested in the Circles of Caring uh, script, that 10-minute script, and want to adapt it, I've used it in Rotary Clubs and other uh, types of venues. I'm happy to, to share it. We can post a link and uh, get it uploaded if anyone wants to repurpose it um, to share with others. Thank you. Um, those are great resources. I know you could have said a lot more about them, but I appreciate um, we are in a bit of a rush. So um, these, we had other questions that had come up. I think uh, what we may do is schedule a time um, for another future webinar to go through some of those questions um, and continue this kind of format. Uh, when we end the webinar, a survey is going to pop up so you can say whether you thought this was successful or not, since it's a little bit of an experiment. Uh, please respond to that so I know whether to schedule another one or not. And um, I just really want to thank everyone who got on the line today as participants, and particularly our volunteers from Georgia and Alabama, um, and my colleagues from CSSP and the Alliance who jumped in to share their thoughts. Um, I know we just have a wealth of information around the country uh, with all the experiences that we've all accumulated doing this work and uh, look forward to finding other ways to continue sharing that, um, sharing all that knowledge and experience. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to leave the webinar open for a moment so you can see what else has been shared in the questions if you haven't scrolled through those yet. Um, if there are links you want to grab um, and things like that, uh, please do. And thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.